Hare Krishna. So today morning is an extremely auspicious day of Sri Gaur Purnima, the appearance day of Lord Sri Gauranga Mahaprabhu. And today I'll discuss on this theme of how Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu relished and shared Krishna Bhakti throughout his life. So I'll talk one pastime and analysis of the Adi Leela, then one pastime and analysis of the Madhya Leela, and one of the Ante Leela. So and we'll try to draw some lessons from each of them. So I'll talk about this in three phases. See that the Adi Leela is more of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's love for Krishna surfacing. It's, it's a surfacing stage. The love surfaces and comes to the fore, forefront. Then the Madhya Leela is about his sh sharing love for Krishna with everyone. And the last Ante Leela is primarily about his savoring love for Krishna. So surfacing, sharing, and then savoring. Of course, any analysis is never foolproof. Because even when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was sharing, he was also savoring. But in the towards the end of his life, he was he didn't travel much. He just focused on relishing internally. So <coughs> this particular verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrit comes when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is still in Puri, in Gaudadesh, and he is endeavouring to go to Vrindavan, but he is unable to go there. So, and he comes back, and then eventually he goes afterwards. So, when he is endeavouring to go, he is saying that, even when the Lord does not succeed in going to Vrindavan, still he is successful in fulfilling his mission of taking people towards Vrindavan. That is, wherever he goes, there's a beautiful alliteration in the first line of this verse itself. It says that Gaudodhyanam Gauradeshaha. So Gau Gau is the alliteration over here. Gauda Udhyanam. So is Gaudadesha refers to the area in Bengal, broadly speaking. One of the names for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement or the tradition that he started is either Chaitanya Vaishnavism or Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Now the word Gaudiya Vaishnavism has two meanings, one external, one internal. Gauda is a geographical name, and it's a, but it's an area around Bengal, uh, associated with the, uh, the Ganga River. So it's a particular nomenclature that comes from there. So that Vaishnavism which arose in that area is called as Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Now this is simply a geographical marker, but Gaudiya Acharya has also explained that there's an internal meaning. The word Gauda is a variant of the word Guda. Guda means jaggery, the special delicacy. And while Guda is available in various parts of India, jaggery is available in various parts of the world, the jaggery in Bengal is considered especially sweet. Has anyone tasted Bengali jaggery? It's almost like chocolate. It's, it's delicious, it's natural, it's delicious, it's nutritious. So the idea of the name Gaudiya Vaishnavism from the internal perspective is that while Vaishnavism, the, devo the path of bhakti manifested through different acharyas in different places. There was Ramanacharya, there was Madhvacharya, there was uh, Nimbarka Acharya, Vishnu Swami. So all these great devotees, they manifested Vaishnavism in various parts of India and broadly speaking, the idea of theistic devotion is there across world trad religious traditions. But there was a special sweetness to the mellow with which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifested his devotion, manifested bhakti. That is Gaudiya Vaishnavism. So Gaudiya Vaishnavism from the internal perspective refers to the special sweetness of the flavor of Vaishnavism that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifested. And what is that special flavor? That is actually the love of Srimati Radharani for Krishna. That this Anarpita Charin Chirat Karunaya Avtir Nakalau Samarpaitum Unnat Ujjwal Arasam is described that Anarpita Charin Chirat for a very long, long time that which was not bestowed that is shared by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And what is that? That is 
special love for Krishna in the mood of Srimati Radharani. So that is considered the highest mood of devotion. And that is what Lishi Jatana Mahaprabhu manifested. So Gaudodhyanam Gaudo so Gaudo Gaurav Meghaha. So the metaphor over here is, first there is alliteration. Alliteration is the same sound. But along with that there is a metaphor over here. Whenever any work of poetry is there, there are various figures of speeches that come in over there. So here the one metaphor that runs through is that, there is a garden. Gauda Udhyanam. So the Gauda Desha is like a garden. And in that, Gaura Meghaha. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a cloud who has risen up in the sky. And the clouds come, uh, the cloud is a very beautiful metaphor because although the cloud blesses a particular, showers water on a particular area, but the cloud does not belong to that area. Now uh, that the cloud is up in the sky, way above the earth, but from there it showers down water on the earth. So of course nowadays is the age of litigation. So there are disputes over property, there are disputes over custody. There is also a new kind of dispute which was not there in the previous time. It's called cloud property rights. It is not cloud means the, the, the cloud computing where you store, it's not like that. Sometimes what happens, there's not much rain and there are clouds in the sky, but the clouds don't shower water. They are there up, but they're not showering water. So then what happens through, through artificial, through some scientific means, I try to seed the clouds and shower water on them. So what happened by seeding sometimes a little rain comes but then you can't control. You may seed the cloud and the rain might fall in a river and then you don't get any rains practically where we want it. But anyway when some clouds are somewhere and they try to do seeding, uh, the other state claims hey, this cloud by its natural wind was going to come to us and would have showered on us. So you stole our property. So clouds are not human property at all. So, the, so similarly Although we may lay claims on it, but clouds are above. Similarly, when the Lord descends to this world, although he may seem to be one among us, but he's like a cloud above us. He's at a different level of consciousness. And from just as the cloud showers rains. Now a cloud can shower rain anywhere. But if it showers rain on the river, okay, still water has come on the earth, but that doesn't benefit as much as the cloud showers rain where there is there is uh, there's a shortage of water if, it, if there is a need for water now the need for water can also be in different degrees there's a place where there is water shortage there is a drought uh, there water falling is special it's very very helpful but imagine if there's a fire there's a wild fire. And even with the best of human technology today, human resources, when forest fires break out, it's very, very difficult for us human beings to extinguish them. A few months ago, I was in California, and there's a place which was called as Paradise. It's a very beautiful, the whole of California is very beautiful. Paradise is very beautiful. But you know, Paradise recently turned into a hell. What happened? There's a foil forest fire that came up and the whole town, it was not exactly a city, a very beautiful scenic town, it was just burned to ashes. Nothing was left. It's like an inferno. And with the best of machinery still, this couldn't do anything. So if forest fire is there, then you know, we can try it with our human efforts to try to extinguish the forest fire. But if rains come, there is nothing like the power of rains to extinguish a forest fire. So we need rains normally, we need rains where there is drought, but we need rains the most where there is a forest fire. So, so here, in a drought, yes, there is distress and there may be pain and there will be gradual death. But forest fire means sudden devastation. You know, one night the city holds whole town is there. Next morning, there's nothing there at all. So forest fire can destroy like that. So here the example is given is Bhava, Gnidak, the Janata, that because of the influence of Kali Yuga, there's a forest fire, a huge fire. Bhava Agni. So there's Dava Agni and Bhava Agni. 
Dava Agni is a big forest fire. Bhava Agni is the whole material world itself is like a fire. Da Bhava Agni dug the janata. People are just burning because of that. In the Bhagavad Gita, in the seventh chapter, the sixteenth verse, Krishna says there are four kinds of people who come to him. Those four kinds of people are people who are distressed, people who are distressed, people who are distressed, and people who are distressed. <laughs> Not exactly, but actually in Kaliuga, almost everybody who comes to Krishna is because they are distressed. Yes, there are three other categories, people who need money, people who want knowledge, people who are curious, are inquisitive. But actually, unless there is some distress, people who are curious, you know, they can just Google and find there's so many objects to be curious about. Somebody wants money, they can just uh, they can just take a loan from somewhere. They don't have to come to God today. The today technology has created so many different means. Even people who want knowledge, there are so many different kinds of knowledge people can get. So unless there is some kind of distress which makes people think, is there something more in life? Broadly, people come to Krishna either because life becomes unbearable. There is so much distress that what am I? What, what is the point of living? Life becomes unbearable or life becomes unfulfilling. Unfulfilling means we have some goal, we have some dream. We achieve that and after achieving it, we find it's an anticlimax. Something great and we ask, what, what more in life? Isn't there something more? So either way, the point is that there is enormous distress and everybody is burning. In the, in the past, there were wars and the distress was much more physical and visible. Now, the distress is psychological and invisible. But still, it is great distress. So, distress is always there. And few things make people as unhappy as the belief that everyone else is happy. <laughs> few things make people as unhappy as the belief that everyone else is happy and unfortunately that belief is what is fostered today in the world because of the media because of the culture and we see happy people in the commercials in the infomercials in the movies and we think oh I alone I'm having so many problems but no everybody has distress so bhavagni dag the janata all living beings are burned in the fire what is that fire it fires of dissatisfaction, of disillusionment, of distress. And ultimately, it is a fire of desire. It is a desire, I want this, I want that, I want that, I want that. And all these desires, we crave and slave to fulfill them. Now most of the desires, we are unable to fulfill them. And that frustrates us. And a few desires, we fulfill them, but still that doesn't satisfy us. And that also eventually frustrates us. So whether desires burn us, whether they are fulfilled or they are unfulfilled. Whether they are fulfilled or unfulfilled, the desires burn us. There is a Greek philosopher Socrates who said that, you know, if, if you marry, if you get a good spouse, you are fortunate. If you don't get a good spouse, you become a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> So the idea is that distress is there everywhere in the world. And Sinchan Swalokana Amritai. So what now Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is compared to a cloud who showers Swalokan. Loka means to alok is eyes. Swalokan means with his own glance. Amritai. He showers nectar. Now it's one thing if there is fire and if you shower water, then at least the fire will get extinguished. But here the idea is, there is not just fire which is burning, but virudha. There are, there are plants, trees, shrubs, which are all burning and dying. So water can extinguish the fire. But he says, not just water that is being showered, but nectar is being showered. Samajivayat. So nectar will not only save their life, but bring them back to prosperity. No, we don't just want to survive, we want to thrive in life. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doesn't just enable us to survive, his mercy, amid this fire of material existence, it enables us to thrive. It's not just that we give up our desires and live up a dry, dreary life of abnegation. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu enriches our hearts with spiritual desires. 
and that makes our life even more stimulating and fulfilling that is the mercy of chaitanya mahaprabhu so let's look at how chaitanya mahaprabhu is a cloud showered mercy over people janata so let's look at this from the point of adilila madhyalila and antalila <clears throat> so after each part of the analysis we'll have a few minutes of reflection if any of you have any questions or comments you can speak that so this was the first part where i was explaining basically the words and the metaphor any comments or questions okay so the adi lila of chaitanya charitamrita first 12 chapters are actually philosophical or rather not is philosophical they are more of analytical it's not pastime start from the 13th chapter chaitanya charitamrita is actually setting the scene in a literary philosophical and intellectual context of who, of who is chaitanya mahaprabhu so the reasons for his descent are described how he has the internal reasons the external reasons and then his position is described and 13th chapter is where he appears and in fact there is a beautiful verse where chaitanya uh, charitamrita says that krishna asks krishna says that actually i offer obeisances not only to Ch lord chaitanya mahaprabhu i offer obeisances to the day on which lord chaitanya mahaprabhu appeared because even that day is sacred now you may say how do you offer obeisances to a day do you put a calendar date and then offer obeisances <laughs> no offer obeisances to the day means the idea of offering obeisances is that it's sacred it's it's permeated in spiritual ecstasy so just so just as the lord may descend in space as a deity or the lord may descend in space as a temple a temple is a place which becomes spiritualized by the presence of the lord so similarly the lord may descend in time and that descent in time is the holy day so gaur purnima ram navmi narsimha chaturdashi janmashtami these are days which are sanctified because the lord has manifested on that day and then it describes the childhood past times and now when the lord descends so the first part the surfacing that's what we'll discuss in the adi lila when whenever the lord descends his purpose is to ultimately attract people towards him in in the bhagavad gita krishna talks about the purpose of his descent in two parts first he says is to establish dharma externally paritranaay sadhunam vinashaay ch duskritam dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yuge yuge that's 4.8 but next verse 4.9 he says it is ultimately the purpose of establishing dharma in the world is to establish prema in the heart ultimately this world no matter how much order we establish there will be disorder is order chaos order chaos that's a things which go on in the world like that but the next verse is janma karma ch me divyam evam yovati tatvatah tyaktva deham punar janma naiti mame ti so arjuna so krishna says that i descend to this world janma karma ch me divyam he descends for the purpose of attracting us towards him that over the when you hear his past times his activities all oh, is so attractive we get attracted to him and then we attain him so the a purpose of establishing dharma in the world is to establish prema in the heart and so when it, so now how do we become attracted to someone how do we develop love for someone when that person is attractive and attraction doesn't suddenly manifest out of the blue actually we all have certain conceptions of what is attractive and then we we see something which is extraordinary within that conception it is so beautiful so if we go to some natural if we have some taste for some attraction for beautiful natural scenery and then we go to a place where it is exquisite this is astounding so people have a definition of beauty of attractiveness a conception and when something within that is extraordinary they get captivated by it it's like say if people are people are uh, today very much madly in love with cricket now in cricket you know what to expect how a batsman should be how a bowler should be how a fielder should be and within that broad understanding of how cricket is played if somebody bats extremely well then that person becomes extraordinarily popular 
but if a person is an extraordinary ice hockey player but nobody there knows, knows what is ice hockey so then no matter how superlative that player may be people will not be attracted to that player unless of course they become they become attracted to ice hockey and they appreciate attract that player. they they turn towards that player the point i'm making is we all have certain conceptions of attractiveness and when something extraordinarily attractive manifests in that conception we get captivated by that so similarly when the lord descends to the world he demonstrates the contemporary definition of attractiveness to a superlative degree when the lord descends he demonstrates the contemporary conception of attractiveness to a superlative degree thus when when there were kshatriya kings ruling the earth and that time the lord manifests ram rama shastra bhutam aham he is the foremost of the archers able to defeat demons whom nobody could face and thus he attracts people when he comes as krishna similarly he is not just he is as the ages descend see ram is simply a very committed principled and a skilled warrior but as the ages descend people become more and more manipulative so when krishna descends krishna is not just a great warrior but krishna is also a great strategist a great strategist so krishna strategically brings down jarasandha he doesn't just go and attack him he is used as jarasandha to bring down all other armies also all the various demons from the world he just gets them at one place and one by one by one he jarasan he let jarasan the go but jaras he becomes krishna is like a very efficient demon eliminator he sits at one place and let jarasan the go jarasan attacks him krishna destroys all the demons who have come demoniac people have come with jarasan and krishna let jarasan go why so jarasan will go and collect other demonic people and again he will come and attack and again krishna will let jarasand go so in this way sitting at one place krishna eliminates all the demons from various places so krishna is not just a great warrior krishna is a great strategist but when shri chaitanya mahaprabhu descends the times have changed he comes in navadweep and navadweep although it is broadly at that time india was under islamic rule but still within that also navadweep was a place of scholarship so it is a place of great vedic scholarship and so when chaitanya mahaprabhu descended at that time he manifests excellence within that definition of scholarship so he is in when he is a small child he is just playful he is so mischievous very similar to how krishna is mischievous in his childhood and he just endears himself to people by his childishness and mischievousness but then as he grows he becomes like a prodigy he is just so brilliant that just at the age of 14 now nowadays if somebody imagine that if somebody gets a i think the youngest phd in the world is 16 or 17 or 18 17 years old or something if somebody gets a phd at the age of 14 so that's outstanding we will suspect this is somebody gets a honorary phd this is a child get a phd at the age of 14 but imagine if somebody at the age of 14 has already started their own educational institute see okay no. we have prodigies but nothing like that but chaitanya mahaprabhu such a prodigy that he had not only mastered sanskrit grammar and sanskrit grammar is actually very difficult to master it is traditionally it said that it takes almost 12 years to learn the rules of grammar itself to master them chaitanya mahaprabhu who had it takes 12 years to master chaitanya mahaprabhu just by the age of 12 had not only mastered everything he soon got the blessings of his teacher uh, and his teacher told him you don't have to learn from me now you teach and by the age of 14 he had established himself as the as the more as the most prominent scholar over there and he had his own teaching school is tola and there people from far and wide would come to learn from him and he would teach with such brilliance 
that you know, see, see, there is there is scholarship that reveals the truth or that establishes the truth. This is the truth and it establishes the truth. But there is scholarship which is such that whatever that scholar says, people accept it as the truth. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so brilliant that he could argue from one side and establish that as the truth. And then he would argue from the opposite side and establish that as the truth. And then he would argue, argue again from the first side and say this is the truth. And finally at the end, Hey, whoever be, whoever be hearing him, he says, so what is the truth? He says, whatever you say is the truth. <laughs> so it was, he was so brilliant that whichever side he would take, you just establish it. And in that way, he captivated people. And then after that, when, at the, when he was just 14, there was this formidable scholar, Kesho Kashmiri. He had travelled across the world and, and he had this Jaipatra is victory card. So whichever scholar he would debate, when they would be defeated, he would ask them to write their name and sign it. He says, I have been defeated by Kishan Kashmiri. And that was like, uh, some people in their homes have their, a wall filled with their trophies. I won this trophy, this trophy, this trophy. So this was like his trophy chart. All these people whom I have defeated. And when he came to, came to, uh, Navadweep at that because Navadweep was a prominent center of learning but all the scholars over there they said we can't face him because it was said that he was blessed by Sri Saraswati Devi and what to do if Saraswati Devi has blessed someone how can we how can we even debate them and they just uh, <coughs> became MIA missing in action just went away from there they went to some relatives play, this play, that place. And when, when Keshav Kashmiri came there, there was nobody there. And then he came to the he came to the banks of the Ganga to take a bath in Ganga. And at that time, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was sitting over there with the students. And when he saw Chaitanya Mahaprabhu shining like a bright moon among the star-like assembly of his students, he was captivated. He says, who are you? And he was, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu at that time was a Nimai Pandit. So Nimaya Pandit, he very respectfully said to him, Oh, oh you are the famous Keshu Kashmir. He says, I am just a simple grammar teacher. He says, my name is Nimai. Oh, you are the famous Nimaya Pandit. And I've heard a lot about your scholarships. Some people are like itching for a fight. <laughs> now, and there's no one to fight, then what to do? So like Jagai and Madai, they wanted to fight with someone. And when they couldn't fight with anyone, they started fighting with each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happened? So now Kesho Kashmiri was looking for someone to fight with. So then he thought, Nimai Pandit will fight. So Nimai, he said, he was about to uh, say, let us, let us have a debate. But Nimai Pandit preempted him. He says, you are such a great scholar. And we are sitting on the banks of Ganga. So can you please speak some verses glorifying Ganga? And then he just on the spur of the moment, composed not one, not two, but hundred verses glorifying Ganga. Now for us to even memorize a verse, even if we recite it hundred times, still it doesn't get memorized. Imagine to compose hundred verses on the spur of the moment. It's extraordinary scholarship. We just did that and Chaitanya Mahap Nimai Pandit students were stunned. They were just amazed. And then Nimai Pandit said, Oh, your scholarship is so amazing. It's like, there one Ganga was flowing and now here from your lips another Ganga is flowing. Mm -hmm. And he was, oh, you understand my glories. Mm -hmm. You know, he was very appreciative. Then Mahaprabhu said, we are all grammar students. So can you please review your grammar verses and tell us what are the, what are the strengths and the weaknesses of the verse you have composed? Now he was just floating in a cloud of ego. And he immediately said, hey, there are no weaknesses in my verses. They are perfect. He said, no, 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 don't say like that. Actually, even in the compositions of great poets in the past, Bhartru Hari Adar, there are, also, there are also weaknesses over there. So please, I will review it. There are no weaknesses. If you think there are weaknesses, you tell me what is the weakness. And, okay, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, let us consider the 63rd verse you have spoken. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is repeated the 63rd verse. And he was taken aback. He says, I just recited all the 100 verses. How, how could you recite the 63rd verse? 
like that. How could you remember it? He says, by the grace of Krishna, he said, some people can recite 100 verses on the spur of the moment. And by the grace of the same Lord Krishna, some people can remember 100 verses whenever they hear it. So he was slowly raising his consciousness, not your scholarship, it is Krishna's mercy. And then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu started analyzing and he analyzed, he said, you know, you have, he, there have been several technical faults he found, but he says, he says well, the one word Bhavani Bhartu. So Bhavani, Bhava is the name of Shiva, Bhavani is the wife of Shiva. So Bhartu is the husband, so husband of the wife of Shiva. He says, what do you mean by this? He says, are you implying that Shiva's wife is unchaste, that she has some other husband? And he tried to speak and he just couldn't speak. What to speak? And then when Nimai Pandit just baffled him completely, his students started laughing. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu immediately said, don't laugh, don't laugh. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to remove his pride, but he didn't want to dishonor him. There is a difference. There is normal respect, there is over respect, and there is humiliation. So, some people, they, they demand more respect than what is due. And we may not give that respect. But we don't have to humiliate people ever. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very, even at that time, he removed his pride, but he did not remove his, he did not strip him of his honor. He gave him a graceful way out. He said, it's been a long day today. It's in the evening. And he just composed 100 verses. You must be tired. You go and take rest. Study your books. And tomorrow come back and we will discuss again. So he gave him a graceful way out. And the next, that night, Kesho Kashmiri, he begged Saraswati Devi. He says, you had promised me that you will never, that you will never let me down. That you will always appear on my tongue whenever I want to speak. So, I will never be defeated by anyone in, from, in this world. So, why? Why? He started crying. Have I offended you anyway? Please tell me. As he fell asleep, uh, crying in agony, Saraswati Devi came in his dream and told him that, actually, I told you that you will not be defeated by anyone in this world. But the person who defeated was you was not from this world. He is the Lord of my Lord. Go and surrender to him. And that's what she, she did eventually. That's what he did eventually. And Keshav Kashmiri became a great Vaishnava afterwards. So the point of the story is that at that time, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was just, Nimai Pandit was just think, thought of to be like, a, okay, he's one boy among us, he's a scholar among us. But by this, he became like the foremost scholar. And many people have this habit of congratulating themselves for things they haven't done. <laughs> That means, like many people, they say that, okay, if somebody else does some wonderful Ratyatara program or some wonderful Janmashtami festival, oh, Janmashtami in our temple was so good. Well, okay, it was good, but what did you do? Did you do any service over there? So what happened similarly, the resident, the scholars of Nimai, uh, scholars of Navdeep, they all came back and they said, just see how great Navdeep is. Even a 14-year-old boy from us defeated Kesho Kashmiri. <laughs> So, they were taking, congratulating themselves when they had done nothing. Hmm? But anyway, this is, this is what happened now, after this. Then when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Nimai Pandit chose to become a devotee by the association of Ishwar Puri, that captivated people so much. Because many people used to think, because of the influence of Advaita Vad from before, that actually for intelligent people, there is Jnana Mark. And Bhakti is for the sentimental people. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu demonstrated that he was the topmost scholar of his times. And yet he chose the path of devotion. And that's how he was able to attract so many people. He, when he became a devotee, it was sensational. So he was, he was among the most well-known persons in Navadip at that time. And when he started manifesting devotion, it is like, say, if you go to a college and some student becomes a devotee, that's wonderful. But if some student who is the university topper, number one in that college, becomes a devotee, 
that will attract everyone. Oh, why did this person become a devotee? What there was something special in devotion. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the way he his devotion surfaced was that he that is every so culture has a trajectory to success. Say in Indian society, the trajectory to success. Maybe you go to IIT, you go to IIM, you go to America, or you go to the West, and then you become successful. So similarly, at that time, the trajectory of success was that you study, you become a scholar. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu followed the trajectory of success, and then he gave up that success to do something else. So if you, by that way, he just attracted everyone toward them. Sometimes when I go to university and I speak in India. Once a professor came and asked me, "You have you were an engineer before? You know, you could you wasted one engineering. India lost one engineering seat because of you. India lost one engineer because you became a sadhu." I said, "India did not lose an engineer. America lost an engineer." <laughs> <laughs> so I was well on my way to go to America. So most Indians they go and actually fuel the American economy, not the Indian economy so much. And I said, "I am trying to serve and." Preserve India's spiritual culture and spiritual wisdom. So, so the point is that in every culture there is a standard definition of success. And if somebody who is successful within that definition, if that person gets attracted to Krishna, the effect on people is much more than if anybody else gets attracted. So when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu followed this, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would have manifested devotion right from the beginning. But he did not do that. Of course, there are some glimpses of when he would cry. He would become pacified only when he would hear the holy names. But he did not manifest his devotion right at the beginning. Because then people would think, oh, you are just a devotee, you are sentimental. He became a great scholar, the greatest scholar of his times, in his place. And then he manifested his devotion. He just captivated everyone by that. That is the surfacing of devotion. This is in one way, the cloud has to shower rains. But people, in the, the, when, when everybody wants, knows that I want water. And they will take the water. But in the case of bhakti, it's nectar. But people don't understand that it's nectar. People don't think that they need it. So then what do we have to do? See, for us, we, don't, we not only have to provide water to people, we have to create thirst in people. I shall not create thirst. It is more that we have to remind people they are thirsty. And we say, if you're thirsty, how can you forget it? No, people don't forget their thirst but they misdirect their thirst. Now there is so much entertainment, so much distraction, so much addiction. So the thirst of the heart is for Krishna. But instead of searching for Krishna, people are searching for hundred other things, million other things. When people love to surf on the net, play this video game, watch this site, go to this, watch this movie. Now whatever people are surfing for, ultimately they are surfing for Krishna. They just don't know it. So for us, we have, to cre we have to create the thirst or remind people that they have this thirst. And then, when you give them water, they will appreciate it. That's why Srila Prabhupada, when he was sharing Krishna Bhakti, in India, the idea of a great religious teacher or a great religious organization or somebody respectable was, we should have big temples. So in India, Prabhupada focused on building big temples where people would come to see the temple and then they would be attracted to Krishna. And they would take Krishna Bhakti seriously. So that's the way Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifested his devotion. At the first part, surfacing. Then we have sharing. And the second part is in the Madhya Leela. The Madhya Leela has a very interesting literary structure. Because Krishna Askar Rajaswami was very old. And he was not sure whether he would live on or not. So till the end. So first he describes in summary all the past times in Madhya Asura Ante Leela. And then he starts describing further. So now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not just manifest his devotion. By the end of Antili, Madhil, by the end of Adilila, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has also taken sannyas. So why sannyas? So that he would have that position of respect in that society by which people would hear him seriously. We don't want respect for ourselves, but we do need respect so that Krishna's message will be respected. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas and he went so far that he actually took sannyas from a, the Advaita, Advaita Sampradaya. But because that was what was respected at that time. He did not become Advaita Vadi. He took sannyas from that Sampradaya so that he would have that respect. And then when he travelled around sharing Krishna Bhakti, probably 
you know, there he had several majestic confrontations. So here we see that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu goes, is on his way to Vrindavan. Now the devotees, they tell him, that he's in, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is in Mayapur, then he goes to Puri because the mother says Vrindavan is so far away, I will never get to hear about it. Goes to Puri and from Puri he wants to go to Vrindavan for almost a year. There is this loving tension between aspiration and affection. There is the individual aspiration, personal aspiration of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's heart is, I want to go to Vrindavan. And there is the social expectation, the affection of the devotees, oh please stay here, we don't want you to go away. And they say, oh now it is Rathyatra, oh now it is holy, now it is this, now it is this, now it is Janmahashami, now it is Karthik, now it is this. And they just keep delaying Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's going. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu cannot desist, cannot say no to them. So finally, after, after a whole year goes by, and again the same festival comes, then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, you will never let me go, now I am going. And then, he starts off. Still, he accommodates his devotees by saying that, I'll take one assistant with me. And then he is on his way to Vrindavan. At that time, so this is the Lord's attempt to go to Vrindavan chapter. So actually there are three chapters over there. The Lord's attempt to Vrindavan is chapter 16 in Madhya Lila. Chapter 17 is, the Lord travels to Vrindavan. And chapter 18 is, the Lord's pastimes in Vrindavan. So now, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Radharani, is Krishna in the mood of Radharani. So he longing to be in Vrindavan constantly. And finally, when he's on his way to Vrindavan, what does he do? This is actually, Chaitan Mahaprabhu has two main preaching tours. One to North India and one to South India. So his South India tour is already over. Where he has just flooded South India with love for Krishna. And now, his Vrindavan tour is also his preaching tour. And while he's in preaching, what does he do? He just, he, wherever he goes, he just floods people with ecstasy. This Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is like a, uh, he is like a live wire filled with the electric current of bhakti. Anybody who comes in contact with him, they get, they get completely captivated. Just get completely mesmerized. And as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is going to the forest of Jharikhand, what happens over there? He is in so much ecstasy. See, ecstasy of Krishna, love for Krishna is like a current. And there are normal, there are normal material laws. But the Krishna Bhakti is transcendental and it can it can transcend material laws. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is dancing in ecstasy and he is so much in filled with love for Krishna that he desires that everybody should have love for Krishna. Sometimes people nowadays say that, why do you preach to others? So that actually you have your you have your belief, you do your practices, don't impose it on others. So it's not a matter of imposition. It's a matter of sharing. Prabhupada gives the example that if somebody has been very sick with a disease for a long time and then finally they have found a cure that works and that cure is, they are, they are feeling so much relieved by that cure and then they see others who are sick by the same disease. They naturally want to share the cure with others. So our purpose is not just to increase the numbers of a particular organization. Our purpose is to raise people's consciousness. Cure people of the petty desires that drag their consciousness down into distress and delusion. So this desire in, in Prabhupada is infectious. Anybody who associated with them felt, they felt that I should also love Krishna. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's desire was so intense that normally wherever he would travel, he would just radiate Krishna Bhakti to others. But he was going through this forest and he had such a surge of ecstasy and there was no one to give Krishna Bhakti to. Because it was uninhabited forest. Now the word uninhabited, it's itself a very anthropocentric word. It's a very human centric word. When we say uninhabited, it just means there are no humans living. There are so many other living beings which are there. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is like, at that time he was in such ecstasy, he wanted to share the ecstasy with someone. So there were no human beings, the only creatures around there were animals. And those animals, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu started singing and dancing in Kirtans, there were lions and there were tigers and there were deer and there were 
elephants and they all started dancing in ecstasy and not only that not only was this extraordinary but even the animals they gave up their natural animosity the tigers and the deer started hugging each other now how does that happen uh, miracles are not against science they are above science they are above science what happens over here is like somebody if they ask you know, how could krishna lifted govardhan hill on his little if this hill is so big and krishna is lifting on one finger how did he find a center of gravity to put his finger on so that he could balance govardhan krishna doesn't have to find a center of gravity because he is the source of gravity he, so similarly chaitanya mahaprabhu he is present in the super soul in the hearts of everyone so normally animals can't perceive or relish spirituality but even in the animal body there is a soul who is just like us and normally the body and the mind obstruct obscure the spirituality of the soul but when the lord is present these normal obstacles he can remove and directly he can invoke the spirituality and from anyone so as all these animals started dancing next to see which at the mahaprabhu servant of the balabhadra he was stunned this not nowhere has been seen like this animal lions and tigers and deers hugging each other and the deer having no fear of the tiger and the tiger having no desire to eat the deer both of them is dancing in ecstasy so what happens by the power of spiritual ecstasy everything bodily gets forgotten everything bodily gets transcended so at a bodily level yes the tiger and deer are antagonists but at a spiritual level they are all souls or partners relishing the ecstasy of krishna bhakti so the real miracle that shri chaitanya mahaprabhu did was not just that he made animals dance was was that actually he demonstrated the universality of devotion and that is the potency which is available even today see miracles are extraordinary occurrences <laughs> that are not repeatable but the point of the miracle is not to standardize the extraordinary but it is to strengthen our faith in the ordinary there is no point in arguing did this really happen what is the evidence that this happened it is not and why is it not happening now if we chant hari krishna is it that a deer will start dancing and a deer will start hugging a tiger no it may not happen the point of miracles is not to standardize the extraordinary it is to strengthen our faith in the ordinary that chandana faith in the ordinary that if chaitanya mahaprabhu could give such ecstasy to people to even to animals then we are in human bodies even if we have animal consciousness still we are in human bodies surely the lord can enrich our hearts with devotion and that faith we can get by seeing chaitanya mahaprabhu extraordinary potency in sharing krishna bhakti so the whole of the madhya lila is large centered on sharing it goes to north india it goes to south india and achandal trata he describes in the bhakti na thakur sutra the gauranga shatana under names of gauranga mahaprabhu there is this guy how wherever he went he just delivered people and then so this is first 24 years is 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 adhi lila he manifested his scholarship at the age of 40 manifested his 14 especially there is a championship victory but then soon after that he manifested his devotion at 24 he took sanyas 24 to 30 he traveled and 30 to 48 for the next 18 years he stayed in jagannath puri and that brings us to the stage of savoring so what are the first surfacing second was sharing third is savoring savoring means just to you know sometimes if you are sometimes we have some delicious sweet rice you know, we are taking it and then it, we may be at have a prasad we are talking with someone but then the sweet rice is so delicious we say let's not talk now let's close our eyes this savoring means no distraction i just want to experience this fully so like that there is undistracted absorption in remembrance of krishna that's what chaitanya mahaprabhu manifests in jagannath puri so savoring is where he is still preaching but how is he preaching by entering 
not into the hearts of new people, but entering into the hearts of the devotees. All the Goswamis come to meet him over there. Various other devotees, they are there with him. They get inspiration from him. In the sixfold loving exchanges between him and the Goswamis that make him his dedicated followers. And then they all go and spread Krishna Bhakti across. But he is there and he is savoring. So there are many places in which he savors. So, but the most dramatic incident in the uh, Antelila is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's dancing in front of Jagannath in the Jagannath of the Yatra. So how oh, he was Jagatopi Vismitaha. Everybody was astounded by seeing Nanartayaha, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu danced in ecstasy. Now, see, dancing is itself an expression of exuberance. That when we dance, it's ex expression of exuberance. If somebody can dance beautifully, it's very attractive. And the Lord is the most attractive person and he's filled with the most attractive emotion, pure love for Krishna. When he danced, he has captivated everyone. There are many miracles over there that he manifested. Multiple forms, there were multiple Ratya, uh, Sankirtan parties and all of them, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifested over there. So now, in his ecstasy, I'll conclude with this point that, now his ecstasy manifested at multiple levels. And what was that? I'll talk about perception, transportation and transformation. So what does it mean? <clears throat> when we talk about ecstasy, what do we actually mean by it? And what is this whole idea of uh, alternate reality or spiritual reality? See, we are souls who are situated in physical bodies right now. So there are broadly four states of consciousness. There is Swapna, which is the, the, gross, the, the soul is here, around the soul there is a subtle body, then there is the gross body. So when the soul's consciousness comes up to the subtle body, but not into the gross body, that is the state of Swapna. When the soul's consciousness comes from the subtle body to the gross body and outwards, that is Jagruti. That's the stage in which we are, hopefully. <laughs> and then there is Sushupti means this consciousness doesn't come even in the subtle body. It just stays in a very deep, dreamless sleep. And beyond that there is Samadhi. Samadhi is where the consciousness goes directly towards the spiritual. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in that Samadhi stage uh, where he was completely absorbed in Krishna. So sometimes you just be walking along normally and while walking along normally, suddenly See, I was we're talking with someone and suddenly the devotee will look, he's disappeared. He says, run! And he saw, saw Krishna behind that tree and he disappeared. And so what has happened? He is with us, but he's not with us. So it's perception. He suddenly sees something extraordinary, which we can't see. So his consciousness is going at another level. That's perception. Then another is transportation. Sometimes Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would just faint in ecstasy. And then, when he, devotees would chant loudly and they would Finally, you would come out of consciousness and say, Why did you chant so loudly? Why did you disturb me? I was in Vrindavan and Radha Krishna were performing these beautiful pastimes. I was observing those pastimes and why did you interrupt me? So he would not only get, there is a transportation. And the third is transformation. Transformation means what he would experience at the spiritual level would transform his body to the physical level. So there's sometimes the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's whole body would withdraw into himself. And sometimes his whole body would expand so that his limbs would become much, much bigger. So the idea was that when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was experiencing Krishna's presence, he was hugging Krishna. So his whole body was contracting. I want to experience Krishna with my whole body. But when you would feel Krishna is going away from him, his limbs would elongate. Krishna, please don't go. Please be with me. And he was stretching his limbs so that he would experience Krishna. So especially the Antalila gives us the very vivid descriptions of the reality of spirituality and how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu experienced extraordinary ecstasy and how that ecstasy is what he has come to gift all of us with. So by practicing bhakti in our own ways, and Prabhupada when he is describing commentaries to these, ecstatic emotion that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is experiencing in remembrance of Krishna, Prabhupada says, the way to enter Radha Krishna Leela is by spreading the glories of Krishna all over the world. So we don't demand the right to ecstasy. We take the responsibility for service. So by the, if we take up the, if we think, why I'm not feeling ecstatic, why I'm not feeling ecstatic, that is not a mood of devotion. Ecstasy will come on its own. But if we take up the responsibility for serving, that's what Shri Prabhupada did. 
Although he was old, to fulfill the prophecy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he traveled across the world. Prabhupada did not say, oh, this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's prophecy. He will fulfill it. He is God. No, he took Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's prophecy as his responsibility. And by that, he was able to attract people to millions and millions of people all over the world. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy manifested 500 years ago, but it is available even now. Through Srila Prabhupada and through his followers, through his legacy that is there with all of us. So we can all pray to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu today that we all, that devotion surface in our heart, that we share devotion and then we savor devotion, following in the illustrious example that he has demonstrated. So Shri Gauranga Mahaprabhu ki, Shri Gaura Purnima Mahamahotsav ki, Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaura Bhaktabinda ki, Gaura Premanandi. <laughs>